So let's do semantic segmentation. And it's a natural continuation to what we just saw about transfer learning. And I mentioned the rest of this course, most of it is going to be transfer learning, literally. You rarely train your networks from scratch because it is time consuming and you need to have a lot of data. And let's start with the semantic segmentation task. Some of the applications are going to be for robots and for self-driving cars. And what is the task? You have an image and in the end, you not only want to know what is inside that image, that's a cat, that's a dog, but you want to know where they are located. So now our labels are, are a little bit different. Our ground truth, our label, labeling task is a little bit different. Previously, labeling images was easier. Why? Because all you needed to do is to have a human take a look at this image and say, there is a cat, there is a dog, that's it. But now the labeler has to go and uh, color code the part where the cat is located sorry, the dog is located, the part where the cat is located, and I guess that's a table probably, and some other objects in the domain. So the labeling is harder, and whenever the labeling is harder, you're gonna have fewer data. So the size of the data for semantic segmentation is smaller than image classification. So that's one problem, and that's why we are gonna use transfer learning. And the other problem goes when you want to deal with the neural network and how you want to design it. Previously, we only needed to worry about what, the what of an image, what is in this image, and that was global information. Now we also need to worry about local information, and our neural network should be able to resolve not only what, but also where. Where in the image is my cat? Where in the image is the dog? So that's a harder task for two reasons. One, you have fewer data, and the other one is that you're interested in the where of the object. So that's a fundamental feature of dealing with semantic segmentation. And all of the contributions that we are gonna see are gonna be trying to deal with this problem. Let's just start with the first one, the fully connected, the fully convolutional network. So we want to do transfer learning. Previously, we had the image of a cat. We would crop it and look at the cat only, and we would push it through a bunch of convolutional layers, and in the end, end up with our fully connected networks. And that one, was gonna give us this score for different categories. And the dominant one was the one that we are interested in. For instance, it's a tabby cat. So this paper came and said, you can treat these uh, features, the fully connected ones, as convolutions. And we know that we can do that because this could be a convolution and it's looking at the entire, uh, so it's kernel size, it's the entire image or the entire tensor before it. So the fully connected ones could be treated as convolutions. Now you can take a look at your entire data set. Once you treat them as convolution, you can treat, you can take a look at your entire image. You don't have to focus on the cat anymore. You can focus on the entire image, push it through your convolutions. And we know that convolutions, they do not depend on the resolution of the input image because you have a filter and then you're sliding it over your image. So the size of the input image doesn't matter for a convolution. Once you do that, rather than ending up with a single number here, you're going to end up with a feature map. So previously it was one by one. Now you have a feature map. Now what is interesting, you can replace the last guy where you had 1000 labels. Now you can replace it with 21 labels. Why is that? Because the data set that we're going to work with has only 21 labels, 21 of these cats and dogs and table, etc. So you don't need all 1000, you need only 21. Up until this point of the network, you can just copy and paste from your ImageNet network. So that's just copy and paste and reinterpreting the weights, the fully connected layers as convolutions. It's just a reinterpretation, nothing fancy going on. The rest of it are going to be the weights that we are going to learn. So we are going to end up with 21 categories that's going to give us the what of the image. Now we need to worry about the where of the image. And as I said, the fully connected layers, we can view them as convolutions with kernels that cover their in entire input regions. Now let's worry about the where. For the where, we have to go the inverse of a convolution. So we have to deconvolve. And we know that the inverse of a convolution is not that complicated. When we were going forward, 
we were doing a convolution, for instance, from 96 and this uh, resolution, we were going to a lower resolution using a convolution. But the backward pass was giving us the deconvolution. We were going from a lower resolution to a higher resolution using a deconvolution operation. And that's going to be the backward pass of a convolution. I'm going to give you the exact formula for this in the next slide. But for now, we need to upsample from a low resolution uh, feature map to a higher resolution one. And that we can do with a convolution with a fractional input stride. So rather than your stride being one, two, or three, you're striding fractionally. It means that you're reusing your weights. That's nothing but the backward convolution. And that's going to be a deconvolution. These names are going to be, you're going to hear about these names in different papers interchangeably. So that's just the reverse of a forward. And that's going to give you the backward pass of the convolution. So these are nothing fancy. I'm going to give you the exact mathematics of it in the next slide. But for now, we need to upsample. And that's going to give us the where. What is our evaluation matrix? I'm going to talk about the loss function in the next slide. But how are we going to evaluate whether our algorithm is doing a good job or no? You can take a look at the pixel accuracy. Let me bring this up. N, I, J. So we are going to have a matrix on, on the rows you're gonna have the correct class, i. On the j, you're gonna have the predictive class. And that's sort of like a confusion matrix. And on the ij entry of that matrix, you're computing the number of pixels that are uh, pixels of class i that are being predicted to be to belong into class j. That's gonna give you an ij, so you're just counting. And that's gonna give you your pixel accuracy. And what is TI? TI is the, total, is the total number of pixels of class I. So you're just summing uh, over J. And that's going to give you a total number of pixels in class I. Now you can have your pixel accuracy. You can define it now. You can take a look at the diagonal of that matrix. You sum it. And then you can divide it by the total number of pixels. And that's going to give you a pixel accuracy. So is this clear? You can have mean accuracy. Again, it's the diagonal divided by the total number of pixels belonging to that class. This one was for one class. Now you can divide it by the total number of classes in your entire data set, and that's going to give you your mean accuracy. You can have intersection over union and mean intersection over union. This part is intersection over union, and I is the intersection. And the union, there is a summation over J going on in TI. And uh, these are all of the entries in your matrix, but you are counting the diagonal twice. So you subtract it once. That's going to give you the union. And mean, because you are doing it over all of your classes, that's going to give you mean of intersection over union. Rather than having one over NCL as a weight for each one of these terms in the summation, you can have a frequency weighted intersection over union. So that's going to give you TI. Now your weight is going to be TI divided by the summation of TKs. Rather than, this is good when your data is imbalanced. That's a good matrix when your data is imbalanced across classes. You can have TI divided by the summation of TKs as your frequency. I think I'm going to stop here. And uh, for those of you who have questions, you can stay and ask. And the ones who want to leave, you can leave. Could you explain how uh, we're recasting the con uh, sorry the, the fully connected layers as convolutions as convolutional layers. Uh, let's take a look at this uh, 256, mm -hmm. and it's gonna have a height and a width. Yeah. Before you push it through a con through a fully connected, what would you do? You would flatten this, mm -hmm. and then multiply that by the weight. Mm -hmm. Or equivalently, you couldn't flatten. You could keep that in its form and reshape your weights because in the end what you're doing is just uh, the inner product of two tensors mm -hmm. your filter as a tensor and your input features as another tensor and you're doing an inner product mm -hmm. so you can get rid of that flattening now you have a convolution with a filter size that is equal to the entire input okay it means that your convolution is going to have a kernel that is of a size equal to this box here. 
to the entire input box. Mm -hmm. And that's how you're going to interpret a fully connected layer as a convolution. And the rest of them are the same. Mm -hmm. From this one to the next one is just easy. And you could also think of that as like doing, flattening the, the, the tensor and then doing the fully connected layer and then just repackaging it back up into uh, the shape tensor you want it to be. It's, um, but it's just easier to do it the other way. Yes, because you want it to be efficient as well. And the other point is... And I guess you're not summing. And the other point is uh, you want it to be automatic. If you have a fully connected layer here, mm -hmm. then uh, what goes in the fully connected is has to be of a particular size. After flattening, it has to have the size that the fully connected layer likes. But if you interpret it as a convolution, you can enlarge your image. And we know that convolutions don't depend on the size of the input image. Okay, yeah. So the fully connected one is a matrix vector multiplication. And whenever you are doing a ve matrix vector multiplication, uh, the sizes need to match up. Otherwise, it's a linear algebra thing. It's not going to compute it for you. It's going to give you an error, your code. But if you treat it as a convolution, now convolutions don't depend on the size of the input because you take a filter and then you slide it over your image. And that's why you have a resolution for this 4096 layer. There is a resolution. The resolution is not one. You have a resolution for it because you have a convolution, you have a kernel that, that you're sliding over your image. I'm interpreting it as mostly just getting rid of the sum, right? Is that correct? You, you just kind of do an element-wise product and then keep the dimensions the same. Is that true? You are you... getting rid of the flattening step. Right, yeah. Because if you were to sum over that resolution, then you would get the same thing as you would with the fully connected, right? The summation is just uh, what you get out of matrix vector multiplication. But, so, but if you did this thing where you have convolutional layers at the end, and then say in that first one of uh, dimension with 4,095 or 96 channels, mm -hmm. if you just, at each channel, if you just did like global ad average, or I guess not global average pooling, but if you just summed up across the, the height and width of that channel, the output would be the same as you would have in that 4,096 vector for the fully connected, right? Yes. So... I think now we are confusing uh, the global average pooling with the fully connected layers. No, no, sorry, that was just my mistake. I was just, I just miss misspoke. But I, I think I think I'm good. But the summation doesn't exist anymore. It's just over your filter. So the way you are gonna interpret this is that you have a filter with a kernel size equal to the input resolution. That's how you conv convolutionalize. You get rid of the flattening. And then you have a single kernel, I mean, multiple kernels, actually 4,096 kernels with a filter size that is equal to the entire resolution of your input features. So does the resolution decrease from 256 to 4,095 from that, like from those two layers? Yes. And uh, the resolution is always decreasing from this to the next one to the next one and then it's going to be equal, and then the resolution increases again. But what's going to happen here is that because your input image is bigger, you're going to have a bigger resolution here. So the resolution that you get is dependent on the size of the input image. But if you have a kernel that's the same height and width as that previous layer, then wouldn't the output just be the same height and width as well? It's the same height and width corresponding to this part of the image. This one is 256 by 256, and that's going to give you this size for your kernel. Hmm. But that kernel size, you can apply it to other regimes. Okay. You can also think of it this way. The, the field of view for this fully connected layer is that cat. The field of view for each single one of these is going to be the cat. But then if you choose another point, another pixel, that's going to be another part of your image. So that's going to be a different part of the image. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Yep. Okay.